Welcome to the Extraordinary Health Podcast with your host, Dr. Paul Beckham. My name is Allie. We're also here with Liz. Hi. And today we're going to be talking about sports injuries, more specifically sports injuries of the upper body, upper extremities. You want to jump us off? I'm going to jump off with this here. I mean, we're going to kind of leave out uh, spinal related conditions right now just because, you know, a lot of people know about that kind of stuff or we have a lot of patients that do come in that have neck injuries I probably will tie some stuff back to that as well here but um, you know when we're starting to talk about the upper extremities we're really starting to talk about then uh, the rib cage uh, as well as like your collarbone and your shoulder blade is really the base of uh, your, your upper extremity and then it heads down into the humerus bone and down into the radius and the ulna in your forearm, then to the carpal bones in your wrist, as well as the metacarpals, and then you have your phalanges or your fingers. So we'll try and just run through all that stuff there. Um, typically, I guess the way I look at things is, is always neurologically first, because uh, we always want to make sure that we're getting that proper connection going back to your brain uh, from your body so that we know that that is, is working well. And then we start to look at uh, some of the bones and joints as far as the structural aspect of things and uh, then the muscles, tendons, ligaments, all that kind of stuff for the functional aspect. So again, kind of going back to uh, really where we're looking at the upper extremity starting is at the shoulder. And I guess one interesting thing to think about, uh, especially with you know, when you get look at the human uh body and all that sort of stuff we don't work walk on all fours we just walk on our feet uh so our arms actually form what is called an open kinetic chain meaning that you know we're not using the hands for weight bearing or anything like that but we're using our hands to grasp things throw things hold on to things and that so they're just operating out in space so uh typically like with the lower extremities i might start at the feet and look at them biomechanically from the feet on up because you're walking on your feet all the time at least most people are um and that way kind of structural wise we want to make sure that everything's stable from the feet all the way up to the hips in the upper extremities we look at the collarbone the shoulder blade and even the rib cage there to make sure that you have a nice stable base basically for your arm uh, so that it's supported correctly there. And if that shoulder blade's off or the collarbone is off, we need to get that structurally aligned where it should be at there and also be testing all the muscles around that whole shoulder girdle, including the pectoral muscles, uh, your serratus anterior muscles, uh, your rhomboids, your trapezius muscles. Uh, just to make sure that they are functioning correctly and we have the proper alignment. In the office here, we'll even use a uh, computerized you know, camera or videography system here to look at your posture. So we can even see if, you know, where is your shoulder aligned structurally here? Uh, maybe you guys can kind of talk about that a little bit with the testing there. Sure. During our... Um kineticense testing so there's a camera that kind of monitors um your movements and where your body is in space it highlights your joints um so we kind of know where they are relative to um you and kind of everything around you um and through our different range of motion um testing that we do it helps us kind of gauge um where there might be any kind of dysfunction in those areas through that that motion capture and you know what's kind of nice is that just with all the tests, it's, it can be measuring multiple different things at once. I mean, that's what's nice about using the computer there. So we can see, you know, is that shoulder structurally aligned where it should be out there? And we can go back and, and when we look at future tests, see just have we gotten that posture corrected there. Yeah, and even through the functional movement screen, even like doing a squat, you can see how are the shoulders even reacting there? Are they still kind of forward? Are they backward? You know, are they maintain the proper alignment with the... Uh, wrists, elbows, and shoulder, you know, through that movement as well. And I like to see that the kinetosense even matches up with some of the manual tests that I do with patients there as far as going through a whole uh, kind of kinesiology exam, you know, of their upper extremities or lower extremities. But um, if 
I usually find that it matches up pretty close to 100% with what I'm finding. So that way I know I have kind of a lab test here in the office that is showing what I'm finding on a patient, you know, doing manual exam or physical exam type procedures. So that way when we do re-exams with the person down the road, we know that we're getting uh, things better. But getting into kind of the sports injury aspect, then you get into, you know, if a person has an, an issue with, you know, their shoulder, you know, we need to really determine exactly where is that problem coming from here. You know, is it, a lot of people just jump right to the rotator cuff. You know, they think, oh, the rotator cuff. Well, I mean, your rotator cuff muscles are meant to do fine control movements. Think of like a baseball pitcher, you know. A lot of baseball pitchers, you know, they can throw really hard, but they have no control. They've more than likely, yeah, fatigue. They have probably either, one, haven't strengthened up their rotator cuff muscles if they're younger, or two, they have gotten older, and they might have developed, they could have gotten a tear in there. They could have just completely overused it. They can get a subacromial bursitis, which actually irritates, uh, like the supraspinatus tendon in there. And, you know, your body's really good at protecting itself. So it's going to just shut that off and have it not work. So a lot of things that I'm going to do here that aren't going to get done, you know, in another chiropractic office or even in a physical therapy office is to get that proper structural alignment of this stuff back to where it should be at so that it can be, you know, functionally sound as well. You know, so it, the closer we get that alignment back, remove, if it's like a bursitis going on, that inflammation out of there get the pain out of there now we're not getting that signal that you know the body is it's when you have that there it's like acting like a circuit breaker your brain is just going to shut those muscles off so they don't work because it doesn't want you to hurt yourself but the problem is people keep doing activities and they just keep aggravating things and they never really fully get it healed up yes rubbing dirt in it and walking it off doesn't really work as well as your grandparents say it does <laughs> <laughs> it might get you focused on something else at the, that moment in time but you know the the sooner somebody can get in to at least get it assessed and get it treated the faster a person can get back onto the field you know the when i've seen athletes if they get in right away to get it assessed we might be able to get them back on the field twice as fast and you'll cut their you know, if you think of something that might take six to 12 weeks, we might cut it down to three to six weeks uh, to get them back on the field. Not that they might be back to full strength, but they're back doing their those functional activities and slowly building it back up again uh, to the point where they're normal rather quickly here. Faster than what they would if they would just rub dirt on it and, <laughs> and <laughs> call it good there. Call it good. Because, uh, you know, you do that. I mean, what ends up happening in your body ends up, you know, filling in some of these issues, so you say a tore a muscle or a tendon or something like that, your body fills it in with scar tissue, you know. If hopefully you have a good diet, I mean, that'll at least help maybe get some good protein laid down and maybe the muscle will heal up a little bit better there. But if you're not taking in enough protein, uh, then your body's just going to fill in with fibrous tissue. And then that's something we have to deal with down the road because now they start doing those activities again and all of a sudden they feel like, there's pain there. There's probably nerves that are entrapped or blood vessels that are entrapped. And we have to do, you know, some soft tissue treatment to get that stuff worked out of there. And again, that's where if you get in to get it treated immediately, you know, I mean, not that we're going to do that stuff probably right away. We're probably going to do a lot of things to calm down the inflammation. You do want to have inflammation happen, though, because you do want to have your body pull away any of that dead tissue or debris, you know, from the injury there. So inflammation is not all bad, but you just want to kind of keep it under control so it doesn't get too wacky or crazy here and cause other issues then. Uh, but then, you know, once we can really start working on them, which is really two to three days probably out from the injury, you know, we'll probably do a lot of other things in the meantime to keep that inflammation under control, like using our laser, uh, using some interferential electric stim, you know, type therapy there. Um could even use a little bit of PEMF, you know, just to help uh, maintain some normal blood control and all that sort of stuff to the area there, which will help keep the inflammation in check. Um, then they can get through that phase, and then we can start literally start working on that soft tissue and just making sure that if they have torn something in there, it's not going to end up with this big, huge 
keloid scar in there because the problem is you know, if you cut your skin or something like that and you know that it's cut wide open there, you go and you get it stitched up, you end up getting a nice little fine line scar there. If you tear a muscle, a tendon, a ligament or something like that, and you just rub dirt on it, don't do anything with it, your body's still going to heal it up. You just don't see it. You just don't realize how much damage is really there. And if you don't get it taken care of right away, pretty soon that can even restrict you from being able to do a lot of activities then because you're not getting it healed up with that nice fine line scar there. That is going to cause minimal, if no restrictions, and it's just going to heal it up naturally. Because that scar tissue, it's... I always kind of describe it to people like a spider's web. You know, if they tear something, it's all of a sudden that scar tissue just lays down all over the place there. And when they come in, we start working with it. We're just breaking up all that stuff that's not growing along the normal lines of stress. So that way we can get that stuff kind of healed up. You know, Allie's a massage, has been a massage therapist. I know you've probably worked with some of this stuff. I mean, what are some of the things that you've seen with people walking in? to get treated for massage therapy wise even well that's why i made the point to mention rubbing some dirt on it and walking it off doesn't help so more often than not um throughout my career um as an lmt or a ca um <clears throat> i see people um will go through like their intake for example first appointment have you ever had any injuries to this area no no well, now that you mention it, 18 years ago, and it's like, okay, so you never got that treated? No. So then we're, we're, we've got a lot of work to do at that point because you've let it go for a really long time. And we're talking all kinds of cross-fiber friction and grasting and all kinds of stuff to get that tissue broken up to get the structure back where it's supposed to be. Because um, like Dr. Beckham said, that spider web, there's not necessarily a rhyme or reason sometimes to how that stuff heals up in there. And uh, if you want things to function properly, the structure needs to be in line with where, where it needs to be, basically. So if you want to get better and be your full potential and be yourself, <laughs> be who you are, um, as an athlete, the sooner you can get in to get that stuff treated, the better, the less rigorous your treatment's probably going to have to be, the less um, lengthy that program is going to have to be. Because um, we've, I've, I've seen quite a few people where we've worked on um, past injuries for weeks, if not months, just to get minimal improvements because it had, you know, had been neglected for such a long period of time. And they already have like arthritic changes going on because Correct. they've been compensating for it for years or decades. And something people don't really know is our bones are constantly changing. You have cells in your bones called osteoblasts and they are constantly at work making things different. They change the structure constantly. Your bones are, con as I speak to you right now, your bones are changing. So that's why time is your friend. You want to um, get in as quickly as possible um, to get those things assessed, get the treatment going so that you don't have um, time working against you and your, your own tissue working against you, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, even get into a, you know, sports specific type activities there too. And that's where, yeah, your bone is going to, respond to the activities that you're doing. I mean, osteoporotic females, let's go up to something like that. That's why you want to be moving around. You want to be walking because you're putting a load on your bones and your bones are actually going to put more bone density back on because you're out there doing a weight bearing exercise. You know, if you can't do that, obviously get into something that you can do, whether that be swimming where you get down to a sixth of your gravity or get on a a bike or an elliptical or something like that so you're taking a little bit of stress off of your joints there but you still need to be putting that pressure on there to yes grow your bones to make sure that they're maintaining you know that density because you don't want to get to the point where you're osteoporotic and you know there's nothing much you can do but going back to a sports related thing is just that any sports related activity. I mean, that's, you know, even why you're going to feel achy and sore when you first start off in any kind of sport, even if it's just getting prepared for that sport, you know, lifting weights or doing calisthenics or anything like that. Uh, you're putting some stress on those bones and that's going to help those bones be healthy and operate uh, the way they should. They're not, yeah, they're not a static structure, which a lot of people think they are. Um, but getting into shoulders, I mean, we talked about kind of rotator cuff, uh, type issues here. I mean, 
again, with those, I mean, we have lots of different therapies in the office that can help out with that. I mean, it could be, like I just mentioned before, like the laser's really good even with acute things. I would say up through subacute, even into some chronic things as well. I mean, it's just really good at decreasing uh, pain and inflammation that's going on. Um, our newest laser even cuts the treatment down by like 80%. It's it's crazy just how fast uh, uh, we can get people better. You don't have to spend a lot of time with it. Even some of that uh, uh, treatment, uh, the time the treatment times are you know a minute to two minutes for some of this stuff. I mean, bigger things obviously take a little bit more time, but you get to the extremities and shoulders and stuff like that, you're probably looking at a two-minute treatment time rather than uh, anything longer than that. And whether it's acute, subacute, or chronic, or the, the level of severity, we can adjust all of that to your specific protocol that we're using. So it would be geared exactly towards you personally. Everything is customized here. I mean, we, we try and dial things as much as possible. We're looking at a lot of research all the time on all the different therapies that we have. I mean, I got stuff, I probably get a dozen different research articles a day. I mean, some of them give me little tidbits of information, some of them maybe not, they're not related, but uh, we constantly are getting information in on, you know, our laser, our uh, sh focus shockwave machine, uh, PEMF therapy. Um, those are the main ones I look at all the time because those seem to be the ones that just give people uh, the best results that, you know, even the combination of all three of those together is super helpful in, in some of these patients that have more severe or extreme type conditions that we need to really get in there and work stuff out. So um, besides rotator cuff there, I mean, you know, once we get everything kind of stabilized there, you know, then we can start to look at, uh, you know, getting some functional rehabilitation in there so you can get that shoulder strengthen back up as far as the rotator cuff muscles go uh, and you know have you start to do more and more sport specific type activities so that you're feeling comfortable because once you start doing some of that stuff it's going to tell us whether or not you have you know some further scar tissue that we maybe need to deal with in there uh, there could be some other therapies we need to use maybe we need to use our uh, radio pressure wave uh, soft tissue instrument in there to help get in there that gets probably two three inches deep uh, it's something similar to using like a Grasson type therapy, but Grasson maybe gets like three quarters of an inch deep. It doesn't get too far down, but uh, once we kind of know what's going on and where you're still having some restrictions or pain or, you know, still being bothered doing some specific activity, we can literally use that therapy to help break that tissue up and get it to function a little bit better. Um and then the, the focus shock wave, I mean, if you have some deep tissue type stuff uh, that really has just this being stubborn, I think what I've found with people here, even with patients that have disc conditions or like a shoulder, you know, adhesive capsulitis or something like that, or you want to get some of those deeper, you know, muscular structures or something like that around the shoulder there, that focus shock wave, we can literally pinpoint with it exactly where the problem's at and make sure that we hit that really well with it and oh, I was going to say you'll be shocked <laughs> <laughs> at uh, just how fast that uh, you'll be amazed can help you get better there it, it's it's of the therapies that we've gotten over the last few years here I would say that focus shock wave has made a big difference in the patients that have had just subacute to chronic injuries here because we can get the pain and inflammation out of there and we can start doing things that we would have never been able to do with them or they wouldn't be able to relax for to get everything taken care of. I've had a patient that had a really bad uh, injury and, you know, we got most of the stuff worked out previously here, but there's still stuff just kind of lagging there. I would say we maybe got 80, 90% of the injury healed up. Uh, but that focus shockwave and the RPW pretty much, I'd say we've gotten 99% of it taken care of now so it's, it's helped get that last bit of scar tissue kind of worked out so yeah if you're one of those people that I was mentioning that's waited 18 years to address any kind of injuries <laughs> odds are we're going to recommend that focus shock wave for you <laughs> it's yeah it's it, it works amazingly well at any kind of scar tissue and and some of the research that I've been looking at here whether it be with the laser or that focus shock wave 
it doesn't really matter how long somebody's had something going on. You know, obviously the amount of treatment that you might need to get it to, you know, get it fully taken care of might differ, but we're able to get a lot of this stuff worked out for people that they thought was never possible before. Uh, they thought they were just going to have to live with it and eventually have some kind of surgery or something like that to get it taken care of. So, but okay, back to the shoulder here. I mean, then you get into, you know, the rotator cuff muscles are the small muscles, uh, you know, that are the control muscles there. And like I say, I know when I've watched baseball pitchers, when, I see, you know, they still have the strength. They can still get the ball in there. It's going at a pretty good speed. But once they start to lose that control, it's like, okay, they've toasted their rotator cuff muscles. They need to be pulled really as, as soon as possible because they just have no more control. And you need to, you know, get the next pitcher in there. But they need to do some work on, you know, if it's not outright strength with those muscles because really to strengthen them, you only need about – they really can only handle up to about eight pounds and then you're going to start kicking in those bigger muscles like your pectoral muscles your deltoids your biceps your triceps and all that kind of stuff uh to be able to you know still do things but they're not made to control things so when you see you know things like that happen or if you notice when you're doing exercises and you feel like you're getting kind of sloppy with it you need to stop because now you're going to start using muscles in ways that they're not meant to be used, and you're actually going to be causing problems rather than helping anything out here. So it's not like just keep pushing through it, you'll get it done. That's not what you really want to do. No. Obviously, if you're getting ready for a competition, and it's not that you're compensating, it's just that your muscles are fatiguing, that's a whole different story. You know, you look at the CrossFit athletes or whatever there. I mean, the higher level ones there... You know, if they're smart, you know, they're not even working out at 100% all the time either. But that's a whole nother story we can get into there as well. But Those CrossFit games are so cool to watch. But, yes, continue. Yeah, I mean, you get somebody <laughs> who's versed in multiple different things. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. you know, a rarity there. So, um, But, yeah, once you start to get, obviously, issues with some of the bigger muscles, that's just going to cause issues more with power. That's where people are going to lose speed, all that kind of stuff. You know, get into a football game or something like that. I mean, see a lot of the, uh, even professional sports athletes, they're tearing their pectoral muscles. You know, they're trying to push somebody, but they're getting out too far, and then they tear that muscle. And that takes, that takes time because those are the muscles that you need for power there. So that's why they're out for a long period of time because they got to get that muscle repaired hopefully it's not torn so much that they have to have a surgery on it but getting that stuff back up to speed can take some time there and again walking it through the whole thing of let's get the proper control let's get it to fire properly again here so you're getting that neurologic control back you know structural wise making sure that the scapula the shoulder blade the collarbone and the humerus itself that upper bone in your upper arm is lined up properly so that you're not causing increased stress on that because once that starts to get out of balance, then you start to throw off the biceps and then you start to throw off even the triceps and you don't realize then how much you've been compensating and stressing these muscles to the point where, hey, you're just not going to get that improved, you know, to the point where it needs to be at there. Um, I mean, there's just different sports where it can start to affect I guess when it's dropped down even like to an elbow or something like that I mean things that I can think of like elbow wise is tennis, tennis elbow, elbow. Well, you got <laughs> what are the common ones that people think of you can think of tennis elbow which is lateral, lateral epicondylitis <laughs> and then you get golfers elbow, which is medial <laughs> epicondylitis but I always think of myself jujitsu because what are you trying to do you're trying to get people to tap out you're doing a lot of arm bars and all that kind of stuff or you're having to grip things a lot and you just put a lot of stress on your forearms and on your elbows and it can literally, you know, get to a point where you just can't grip anything anymore or you start to develop almost like a carpal tunnel syndrome because you've now developed your forearm muscles so much that you're even entrapping uh, the median nerve where it tra or, you know, travels underneath pronator teres pronator quadratus and even through the carpal tunnel center or carp through the underneath the carpal tunnel itself there um kind of going on from there <laughs> a 
what, what else do we want to get into here? Um, you know, forearm stuff. I mean, you think of, again, you know, baseball things, football things, where you're any kind of sport where you're throwing, volleyball. You know, you can put a lot of stress on, especially the flexor tendons there. I mean, that's where I see a lot of people have problems. Even people that are just keyboarding uh, are putting a lot of stress on their flexor tendons uh, in their forearm. So more like a golfer's elbow, medial epicondylitis there. And they are literally ending up with a bit of, you know, carpal tunnel from it because those muscles are just getting overused. You have kind of a repetitive stress injury with the keyboarding people there. You know, volleyball, you know, you're all of a sudden you're hitting that ball, hitting that ball, hitting that ball, and you're literally to control it, you know, you're flexing, you're extending your wrist, and you end up just getting, again, more a kind of repetitive stress injury there. Uh, obviously a little bit of a different nature than keyboarding, but uh, that can end up causing some numbness and tingling, you know, down into the hand again because you're now stressing that median nerve. And probably causing inflammation in that area, impeding that nerve as well, yeah. Oh, definitely. You're definitely tearing some muscles probably as you I was thinking about that. like, I used to have a couple of, now that you brought up the being a massage therapist in the past, I used to actually have a few clients that were um, semi-pro disc golfers mm -hmm. and you would not believe the amount of strain oh, yeah. that these guys put on their wrists yeah. and forearms it's a lot of snap in the wrist um, and your, yeah quick snap of the wrist yep and that's gonna it's they're always inflamed before <laughs> before tournaments it's crazy mm -hmm. um i if only i had a laser back then <laughs> but yeah you yeah. know it's i mean you get the all the sports where there's like i say any kind of throwing or whatever it was just backyard sports that you're playing i mean little uh little cornhole little cornhole going on there. Cowboy golf. Think of the people that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they'll literally end up, you know, causing a little bit of a stress on those flexor tendons as well because you're trying to throw those bags and get them in the hole and you're putting some spin on them, whatever. I mean, it's just all the same there, just getting that repetitive stress kind of injury there. Tennis elbow, that's kind of a little bit different or any of the racket kind of sports there. Now you start to kind of really aggravate more of those extensor tendons because you're really getting back and kind of having to snap through and then that's literally stressing those extensor tendons then. So you can get some tears in them. Again, I, I don't know why I was doing something here. I think I was putting down a patio here last summer myself at home, laying down some patio blocks and all that kind of stuff, plus just a bunch of other things, and really gave myself a really bad kind of case of tennis elbow there. And it was the focus shock wave that, I mean, it took me, I think it was worse than what I thought at the first, when I first started treating it there. I think it took me about 11 treatments to really get it kind of knocked out, but I really have not had any issues with it since. So, um, everybody's different here. I mean, there's so many different kinds of conditions or different kinds of sports that can cause issues. You know, I hate it when they throw names on things because people are like, oh, it's golfer's elbow i can't get that because i'm i'm not golfing playing volleyball yeah i'm not a golfer i'm playing volleyball or i'm playing yes you basketball, can get tennis I mean. elbow from playing pickleball <laughs> <laughs> and pickleball is becoming really popular yes. right now even in even in the city of fargo and the fargo area where we're located it's becoming incredibly popular so if you're one of those people that used to be kind of a couch potato and you decided you're now a pickleball weekend warrior and you're here you've got some aches and pains and you're getting sore maybe want to get some things checked out <laughs> and you probably have a little bit more problems than just elbow problems but i got some knee and foot and hip issues as well but we which we will get to we'll get to probably <laughs> <laughs> otherwise we'll be here forever forever <laughs> But so um, other than laser and shockwave um, and PEMF that we've mentioned, we also, do, I mean, of course, you might want to get things adjusted. Again, that structure and function is incredibly important. Um, a little decompression, too, can go a long way if you've got stuff going on um, with your upper body. We want to make sure your neck and everything in your in your upper back is in line um along with those those shoulders and elbows and wrists um we also can do kinesio taping in the office um grass and technique which we talked about the rpw um so basically any issue that you might have we can kind of tailor make a uh, a treatment program just for you and what your goals are what your issues are what your history looks like and what your future looks like so we can tailor make any kind of treatment plan that's going to work best for you needless to say though long story short doing something 
about it is going to be about 100% more effective than just rubbing dirt on it and wiping it off. <laughs> if there's Definitely. anything give or take, to take give away. Give or take a few yeah. percentage points. That's not an official statistic, but. <laughs> so I'm sure we'll probably cut the podcast off here, but um, we literally have like the wrist and the hand left here uh, that we really need to get into here, and that would probably take us a whole nother half hour. So I think what we'll end up doing here is on our next podcast here, we'll just get into I think the wrist and the hand so we can kind of go over that. Uh, otherwise we'll be here or you'll be listening to us for a long time. So to be continued. Thanks again for listening. Yeah, thanks again for listening here today. <laughs> Tune in again next Allie week. We can't hold it in here. No. <laughs> Talk to you soon. <laughs>